right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor with Sutton Group Ottawa. And we are joined today with Carrie Irvin, Carrie Irvin Communication. We're going to be telling a lot of stories about how Carrie had started. Tell me a little bit more about the business, Carrie Irvin. How long have you been doing this? What's the story behind it? This worked for a long time, but this is uh, a new sort of, you know, a new venture for me. So I started, I working for myself over a year ago, it kind of came to a crossroads in my career and was trying to decide, do I want to go back to corporate marketing? I've done a lot of corporate jobs too. I've, I've been a marketing director at shopping centers for many years and found that to be very fulfilling and, but decided that this was like the right time in my life. I gained a lot of experience over yeah. the years. I worked with a lot of organizations, nonprofits and and so the business has been coming naturally, and I've been able to do some great work for great organizations. So what I do is basically marketing, communications, and PR. Marketing, communication, and PR. That's a very loaded sort of I know. People all are always, put together kind of thing, right? Like, well, people are always com- confused about marketing, really. But it, it, essentially, it is all of the things that would affect your brand. Uh, it's paid advertising, it's it's PR, it's social media, it's websites. And my favorite kind of projects are where I get to do all of those things mm-hmm. to promote an organization or brand. So an example of that would be we just did Shepherds of Good Hope, Taste for Hope. We did all of the marketing and PR for that event. And for six, I think actually it was like eight months in total, we developed a brand new logo, a tagline, a website, and then we did all of the social media content. We worked with a team at, at uh, SGH, David Gourlay, of course, one of my favorite guys in the city, does great work. And uh, we just created a PR campaign as well. We had chefs out doing interviews. We had David out doing interviews. So I have longstanding relationships with uh, the media in the city because of my mm-hmm. career. And uh, it was nice to be able to do something so good. So at the end of the day, they sold out 550 people at wow. the Law Center. And they get, they uh, raise three hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars for Shepherds of Good Hope. So that always feels yeah. good when you've had even a little part in that. Amazing. Someone yeah. would call that a an absolute success for a marketing campaign. <laughs> I, I would. I'm doing mm-hmm. post mortem for them right now. So I'm <laughs> detailing exactly why I think yeah. it's a success. But those are my favorite kind of projects, where it's everything nuts to bolts, and it's building a whole marketing campaign. And then creating all of the pieces that go into it. So you're not just doing one part of it. I have been doing a lot of PR lately. There are not a lot of PR uh, people in the city, I I don't think. Uh, From a private or a commercial perspective, there are a lot of uh, political or more government relations. uh, To You know, it's Ottawa, so that makes perfect sense. It does. I mean, Ottawa is not like, uh, we're we're not like L.A. or, you know, some of those hotter places where we've got, you know, obviously... uh, artists and people that are famous and what have you that they would right. need to have a PR person sort of on staff all the time. Right. What makes a really successful marketing campaign? Well, I mean, people would tell you, obviously, the measurement, the KPIs, you know, how, now it's all about numbers. But what I would say makes a successful marketing campaign is if you have created awareness or you have raised Funds, you have elevated the brand, mm-hmm. amplified something to the point where people not only know about it, but think very highly of it and have high regard for, for whatever yeah. organization that is. That's what I love to see. And then, of course, there are all kinds of measurements to tell you that, you know, your social media numbers, your newsletters, et cetera. Of course, of course. And would it be safe to say, like, you have to actually define those measurements first before you measure to see if you succeed? Yeah, like there are all kinds of ways to measure, you know, Website analytics, you know, social media analytics, all of those things. So when we work with clients, we make sure that we're tracking those all along. And especially with PR, you can, you know, track all of your media coverage. And so at the end of the day, I provide a report to clients uh, with with all of those uh, KPIs. And and you hope at the end of the day, but something like even attendance at that event, uh, the kind of exposure that we received for those all factor in. And the quality of the attendance sometimes also. And the quality. Of, yeah. Exactly. Makes a huge difference. And that's. You don't want to just have seats, warm seats. Right. What is the event experience? And it goes back to my shopping center days where it was all about the customer experience. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about it. What shopping center, if you don't mind me asking first? 
Oh, I don't mind at all. So when I came out of uh, right out of college, I um, I worked at Rideau Center, and that was a dream job for me at the time. I, I mean, it's still a fantastic place. Uh, I always say it's still my wheelhouse every time I, I mm-hmm. walk in the door. And then I be- so I became the special events coordinator there and worked for for many years. Then I went on to be the marketing director at Saint Laurent Shopping Center, and and then after that, did many things and came back and was actually marketing director twice. I liked it so much, I came back a second time. Oh wow! Yeah. And I worked for the like seven years. Uh, this is just like a few years ago, and absolutely, I, I love that world. I'm a I'm not going to lie. I'm a fashion girl, and I love the retail mm-hmm. end of it and the mm-hmm. fashion end of it. So we would do a ton of fashion shows and <clears throat> all of the things. But um, and working for shopping centers is a great learning ground because you're doing everything. So I did all of my own media buying. I worked with creative agencies to do all the creative, of course. <laughs> so uh, we would do everything. So we have a, a large budget. Marketing directors yeah. and, and shopping centers have large budgets, and we would do everything. So from transit shelters to billboards to um, you know radio, television. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is Melissa Lamb and I used to do mm-hmm. a fashion. Um, I haven't uh, seen her in a long time. You I haven't? Yeah. Oh, she was at Taste, and she was our influencer for that as well. We did some videos with her. But she and I did something called Trend Talks, and we would go to all of the different retailers, and we would pull all of the cool things that they were showcasing that season. Yeah. And, yeah, we would do these these videos, and it would be on uh, CTV every Friday. So that was one of the things. I also became a spokesperson for this shopping center, so I was on their shows a lot, CTV Morning Live, the nice. radio shows, et cetera, which is sort of where the relationship with the media built up. And we became sort of that go-to expert if they – had a question about shopping at Christmas time, then I was the person that they they called. And that's something I like to do for clients now is, you know, create a situation where you are the expert in your field, like for you would be real estate. Mm -hmm. So that when the media has a question about something that's happening in the real estate world, they would direct come to you naturally because you have that relationship. Yeah. And that's the thing, like uh, building sort of that public relation is is really key in being able to be that person, right? Where essentially the the person that they go to exactly what? and and media is changing so there's a huge change in yeah. the landscape now media there's less you know uh traditional media there are fewer reporters i mean we've all we've seen that so it's really changed in terms of pr now it's like the podcasts and the blogs and the newsletters. yeah so i spent a lot of time trying to find these really niche podcasts for instance for instance i have a um a client called the good games which is canada's biggest festival of sport happening in guelph on july 6th and 7th mm-hmm. so they have something called like an iron dog competition so we've been targeting actually pet uh podcasts and people who are pet lovers for it so that's how detailed and targeted we can be so it's it's a new landscape yeah. in that i think that's the one that you were on the if i'm not mistaken you're on rogers tv Sort of promote or... I was, and that's right. We met that's there. That's where we met, yeah. That is where we met. We were both going on to... Yeah. Pro- what were you promoting? I was actually promoting two things. I was promoting... Well, three things, to be exact. I was promoting Beyond Networking. I was promoting uh, right. Real Estate and also my, my podcast as well. Oh, yes, because you were on with Sarwar. Correct. Yes, that day I was on, I believe, with my client who had come from Guelph to yeah. talk about uh, the games. And it's just... It, it's fascinating because it's a huge festival. So it's it's interesting getting media in those. So I'm working with, you know, Guelph and Kitchener and Niagara and the Toronto media. So I've been doing, over my career, I've worked locally, of course, but I've also lo- worked regionally and nationally. Mm-hmm. I've worked on some really big projects when I was at Saint Laurent. One of the projects I'm proudest of was a girl self-esteem campaign that we did with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Canada. Mm-hmm. And we had 20 shopping centers involved. So I worked for Morgard, and I was the task force leader for this campaign. It was their first philanthropic campaign, so they'd never really done anything like that, a cause marketing and initiative. And it was incredible. So we were able to create impact all across Canada. We had them on, you know, we had young girls on ETA Canada talking about self-esteem. We had a whole website and toolkit. We did amazing work with Big Brothers Big Sisters to bring their stories to light. So yeah. it was all about storytelling. And uh, yeah, it was just, I'm still so proud of it. We even had Tara Shannon, who is a local singer-songwriter. I'm, you yeah. may know Tara. She actually wrote the theme song for us for oh, wow. you. I did not which, know that. 
Yeah. Oh, I should. I have to show you the video. It's absolutely amazing. I'd love that. And then when we had the song, we thought, how are we going to get the song out? So we did a music video. I had never done a music video before. We shot it at Salara Shopping Center, and it was an amazing experience. All of the volunteers, they were kids from Big Brothers Big Sisters that were in the video. Mm -hmm. My niece was the the lead role. And uh, to this day, I just presented this at a at Banfield last week and showed them the video, and everybody in the crowd was tearing up. Oh, wow. Oh, you can't watch this video without having a little, you know. That's amazing. Yeah. So I just want to dig a little bit more about Carrie's story. Like, how did Carrie start doing marketing? What Carrie's got story. you turned on to this? I think I just, how you know what got me turned on was, I guess, going to God. So I started, I, I went to Carleton, and I thought I wanted to be a journalist mm -hmm. because I love to write. And so still, I love to write a press release or um, be involved in marketing writing, especially. So I love to write. I thought, huh, that seems like a natural path. But then I realized, actually, and sort of going back to our conversation before about introverts and extroverts, yeah. I realized that that was a very introverted career in that you spend a lot of time sitting at a computer writing alone. Yeah. And that's just not me because I am an extrovert. And I knew that that people part I would I would miss. And I'd heard about this creative advertising program at Algonquin, and I thought, you know, that just seems perfect for me. It's, it was advertising, it was copywriting, it was PR. And so I changed streams. I, I left uh, Carleton and, and went to Algonquin, and I absolutely loved that. I actually, so now it's kind of cool because it's full circle. I teach now in that same program oh, wow. that I took uh, many years ago. And I knew right away that it was my, my thing. You know, sometimes you just know. And then in terms of being in Ottawa and knowing that it's a very government city, I was looking for somewhere where I could also, you know, flex my interests and my passion and sort of combine the things that I loved. So when the job for Rito Center came up, like it was, the, they always do a co-op placement at the end of this course. Yeah. There was only one job I wanted, Fatty. I wanted that job at Rideau Center because to me that embodied everything that I wanted to do. Yeah. And so I remember my coordinator at the time, uh, Tom Kearney, very nice guy, said to me, Carrie, you can't just go on one interview. Like everybody else is interviewing too. Like somebody else might get that job. And I was like, Tom, that is my job and I'm going to get it. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I walked in the door and I met the marketing director at the time and she and I hit it off um, because we sort of shared the same uh, interests and, and passion. And uh, I just worked my butt off and I loved every minute of it. And I thought when I left school, if I could do that within three years, if I could have the special events coordinator position at Rito Center, that would be like dream job within eight months things changed in on their team and I got a call saying do you want to come back as special events coordinator and I was like yes how fast yes. how fast do I run yeah. sign me up <laughs> yeah and that just started my career on such a, a positive note it, it really has I, I learned so much I learned so much from the people I worked for there I, we did such great work because when you're at Rideau Center I mean we were downtown we were part of tourism mm -hmm. part of the West End part of the Shaw Center you know, it's, it's a, it is a bit of a different kind of layout and, and sort of weird the hours as a mall. Just yes. Because, again, it's it's in the downtown center. It's not like, you know, it's also pandering to tourism and all of that. For sure. You don't close normally with normal hours like other right. malls are closing or yeah. holidays or things like that. They're actually always open. Yeah. And I was actually there when we um, applied to be a tourist destination so mm -hmm. that they can now be open on those holidays that other shopping centers have to be closed yeah. because we were downtown. And we were open basically 24 hours a day because you have the bus, the buses on Rita yeah. Street and then the buses on Mackenzie King Bridge. So we had to be a thoroughfare. So it's a very interesting venue, if you will, uh, as well, because it does... You know, there are a lot of crisis communications things that come up oh, yeah. when you're downtown as well. Different it's, clientele. My time at Rideau, I spent about maybe four years working there as well, too. It's never a dull moment. <laughs> never a dull Never a dull moment. Oh, my gosh. After Canada Day, I can tell you some stories about coming into work the next day. Oh, yeah. No, I, oh, yeah. I've, so, seen, I've seen those stories. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, and we did such cool stuff there. Oh, my gosh. When I look back at some of the uh, major events yeah. that we hosted, probably never have that opportunity again. And at 
that time, it was there was there was a lot of money. It was sort of pre-recession. Uh, we were doing massive uh, fashion shows, even at the Chateau Laurier, mm-hmm. and drag all the clothes over there and do big shows. And in Center Court, we had major stars come, you know, autograph sessions. We had uh, lots of celebrities doing celebrity appearances, yeah. and it was. And fun. it's also that relationship too with the Weston and like having the Weston there. Just it makes makes it so easy. Yes, I remember one time. So we were doing a, a charity, and I can't remember right now what the charity was, but we did a progressive party. So we started it off at Rideau Center in the center court, and I think it was like, you know, drinks and cocktails. Then we moved to the Shaw Center for a big, beautiful dinner. And then after, we went to the Westin Hotel upstairs for like a midnight chocolate buffet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a fabulous event. You got to see all yeah. three. three and it's all within the walking distance. Like, yeah, there was a lot of like yeah. collaboration. So anyway, that's how I got excited about it, I guess, was was through school. Marketing would always seemed like a natural fit for me. Mm-hmm. And then through that job, I ended up doing a lot of PR. And I, I ended up doing all of those those interviews and sort of getting my feet wet and, in terms of that part yeah. of, of my career, too. So what defines a really good PR, whether it's for a business or for a, I guess, celebrity, in your opinion? So in my opinion, I'm going to say... I, people have called me pleasantly persistent. Mm-hmm. So I am I'm not a pushy person by nature. That's just not my thing. Um, so I like to present people with the reasons that, you know, this is important for, you know, to give them coverage or it's important to sponsor. It's important to be part of a certain event. And then I, I like to think I'm pleasantly persistent about it. You have to be like a digger. You have to be able to really spend some time finding out who those those target publications or who that reporter is that it might really people often think that because you have a good relationship with with the media that that means it's easy for me to just and that's not the case your your relationship is only as good as the story correct so that's where being a good writer comes in i think it's very important for someone who uh is is a good writer and can find that hook and that angle to a story so that if you're pitching that reporter, you know that their audience, like it's understanding what the audience wants. Because, you know, example is, and I'm constantly doing this type of uh, work with clients because clients think because they're excited about something that everybody's excited yeah, about it. Yeah. And that's not always true. And and that's the thing. It's like the, the point of view is completely different, right? Like the, exactly. not everybody is seeing what you're seeing. Right. So a PR person has to manage the excitement and the um, the needs of the client in terms of them getting exposure with the idea of what what does the audience want what what does this show uh, you know like to focus on what are the types of stories they like to do and then understanding that that it's, landscape yeah it is it's kind of unique actually because I remember when I approached you about coming on the podcast your first question was what is the show all about. <laughs> tell me a little bit more about the story, what you're trying to tell, what who your audience right. are, and all of that stuff. And that, like, that's actually exactly why I'm asking those questions, just to kind of see, like, how are you doing this? Yeah, no way. Yeah, it's interesting because, for instance, I have clients who are, you know, doing with Helen, who is doing the Good Games, is is a woman in our next chapter doing this incredible event, and she was a pro soccer player. So she was a pro soccer player, and now she's doing this Canada's biggest festival of sport. And so the idea that she's got the second chapter, well, what I did was I looked for opportunities for her to be on podcasts that are about women over 50 who are doing incredible things. And sure enough, that's, you know, we've been able to get a lot of exposure for the games based on her career and her incredible story. Yeah. Yeah. And for someone that's starting out, like whether it's a business or, you know, like I'm going to say an entrepreneur, what would be the best way to, like, where should they focus their kind of, you know, energy on when it comes to marketing and PR? Right. Well, if you're starting out, I mean, you need a good foundation. And that foundation can be as simple as a, a really, you know, simple but effective website so that people can find you, know what you do. Social media, making sure that you've got a really strong social media presence and then spending some time growing uh, your followership. That's very important because it may be the only way you can afford to communicate at the beginning. Yeah. Not a lot of small businesses have a big paid advertising budget. So that's one of the things. And then making sure that you understand, I, I feel like clarity of purpose is really important when you get into business. 
knowing what you're good at, knowing what you can bring to the table for the client, I think is is everything. And then communicating that through all of your materials. So making sure that your branding is on point, that when people do see something that that they understand what it is that you're doing. Yeah. And I've, I've uh, read this book by Simon Sinek about why start with the why. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I feel like every business has got to start with the why. Like, why did I get into this type of business? Right. Why am I doing what I'm doing? It's so true. And then have that sort of guide you through the whole process. And I think marketing really needs to be revolving around that. At least that's my opinion. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? I, lo- I love Simon, of course. Oh, he's, a right, right. he's a genius. Yeah. Uh, and I love the idea of like the power of why. And I think that's really important when you are working with an organization and you're a marketing person is to sit down and, and understand that. So in everything that you do for them, that that has to be front and center. So I, I totally agree. And sometimes that's, you know, with small business owners, it's, you know, figuring them out and understanding their personality so that anything that you're doing and creating logos, websites, branding, that it all reflects, you know, who they are. Uh, authentically. It's just, I think authenticity is, is huge uh, and it's important right now. We yeah, and it shows. It shows in every transaction, every sort of interaction that you do with people. If you're not authentic, they can smell it from a mile. Isn't that so true? Like your integrity, your character, your value mm-hmm. just all comes through. And so what I like to do is really know and understand the client and their business so that I can then reflect that and, and amplify that out into the marketplace. So, for instance, sometimes if you're writing a thought leadership post for on LinkedIn for a client, it's like to find their voice and help them communicate their message in a way that, that makes sense to them. Yeah. And that's actually, um, it's a big one, especially for a lot of businesses. Like, they, they do have the expertise. They know kind of like the know-how and all of that stuff. But sometimes being able to articulate it, it's yes. probably their biggest hurdle. I think so too, or the time to articulate. Or the time to articulate. Because when you are opening your own business, as you know and I know, it's the, you often don't have time to do your own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. so busy working when you're, you're oh, go, 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 and you're everything. You're doing all of the, wearing all the yeah. hats. Yeah, wearing all the hats is a good good way to put it. And it's uh, a lot of the times I find it's, you, you got to pick a time between working on the business or working in the business. And that's, that's so true. That's it's, it's a juggling act. Sometimes if you can bring someone in who can help you with those pieces and mm-hmm. help you with the marketing side of things, it makes your life much, much easier. I also love working with nonprofits because they often, uh, one, I'm, I don't know if it's my empathy, but I, I always want to help and give back and amplify the good work that, that is out there. I feel like nonprofits are doing this incredible work and, um, you know, doing it on sometimes small budgets and trying and and people don't know about it people don't know yeah. sometimes all the amazing work that they're doing so that type of project really speaks to me and i i love working with them and amplifying all of this great stuff that they do mm-hmm. so shifting over a little bit more towards entrepreneurship mm-hmm. you, you know you're starting your own thing you're doing your own marketing you're doing your own pr you're doing all of that tell me a little bit more about what got you deciding to start your own thing and actually delivering it for you? Okay. Oh, my gosh. So this is like, I, I've always been an entrepreneur. And I feel like even when I worked for other companies, mm-hmm. somehow I always bring an entrepreneurial flavor to it. I, I've never really been someone who, you know, who sits back and does a corporate job and doesn't like put my all into, yeah. into anything. So I have actually been an entrepreneur many times over the years. <laughs> this is not my first go around. And I always seem to come back to it. Like I'll, you know, do something else for for years as a marketing director for, you know, seven, eight years. And then um, now the entrepreneurship bug always is is there gnawing away at me. And I actually have owned my own store. I've had my own marketing company before. I used to have a company called Blackbird Communications, which I did for many years and and loved it. I mean, what I love about it is that you get to work on all these different projects and yeah. all of the, it's never dull. It's always exciting. And you're always, you know, helping other, other people uh, and help them be successful, which really appeals to me. So I guess, you know, I'm not sure what it is about it. I'm also very independent and I love to work for myself. That 
that is something that is important. I sometimes, um, you know, I'm a bit of a free spirit and I'm also a builder and I really, I get bored when things, if it's just maintaining what you've already built. Yeah. I'm bored. I get bored it's by that. Funding. I'm a creative person, right? So yeah. that creativity kind of, I love when something is starting from scratch or starting at this point and then you know that they yeah. need help in terms of building it and that I get to help create and do that. Any day where I get to work with a designer or, or you know, write some amazing marketing copy or do anything creative are my favorite, favorite days. It's funny you say that because like, you know, just having that mundane, it's really the biggest thing why a lot of entrepreneurs get into it. It's, yeah. They don't want to have that mundane. They just want to be, every day is different. Every day is something new. Yeah. It's, every day is a challenge. Next step, next step, so on and so forth. Yeah. I love when earlier you're like, oh, so what are you doing for the rest of the day? And I, was, I started laughing. It's like, <laughs> I have the day packed. Yeah. And that's the thing with entrepreneurs. Like, you're always going to, your day packed somehow. And if you don't, you're really not doing anything at that point. Like, yeah. You're not building the business in a way yeah. that it's supposed to be. And that's what's really different for me this time around. Because when I've had my uh, previous uh, companies, I have I was a mother of young children. My kids are grown now. Mm-hmm. And I have the time to put into it that before I think it was a little harder because, as you say, when you're an entrepreneur, I mean, I, you basically work all the time. I, I say being a founder and a CEO, it basically means you take on all of the financial risk. You take all of the responsibility when something goes wrong and you basically work night and day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a minimum of 90 hours a week is normal. Yeah. So back when I had kids, that didn't really work out so well. And it, it helped to then, yeah. you know, go to something that was more nine to five. But of now course. I've got that time to devote to it. And uh, and, and I really, really love, love that. So yeah. yesterday, you know, we talked about it. It was a, it was a busy day. We were up in the morning do, doing, I was doing the cancer uh, breakfast for the Cancer Foundation. And then it was, you know, stacked until last night. But, but hey, I can do that. It's all good. Uh, there's something to be said about like creating the time, right? Like, it's a, you know, a lot of people are like, well, how do you get to do all of that in one day? You know, everybody has 24 hours at the end of the day. Get it. Right. But you're choosing what you fill up your day is really where it makes a difference. Yes. And that freedom to choose. Exactly. And it, it's also the freedom to choose the clients that you want to work with. Mm-hmm. And it's to choose the kind of, you know, the, or even the people you want to work for you. So, since I've started, we've we've sort of grown very quickly, and I have four contractors working for me. I'm, Amazing, yeah. Yeah, so it, I mean that helps to have someone doing some of some of the, the work. Yeah, the work. I've got a designer, writer. Uh, I have a virtual assistant who is so much more than that. She's amazing. So she's my marketing coordinator, and uh, we work our little team. We're just a small team, but uh, we're doing some amazing things. So that that's really helped free me up to do some of the things that I'm. I'm best at as And I think it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, a lot of entrepreneurs fail to give up certain things. Yes. Where, you know, like, you know, you got to, every now and then, like at least once a month, you have to sit down and go, okay, so I'm doing all of this. I've done all of those meetings, all of those things last month. Where am I at? What can I take off my plate? Where can I outsource some of it? Yes. Is it going to be better if I outsource it, if I'm going to keep it in? Like, what am I supposed to do? And that's one of the biggest things that I find a lot of entrepreneurs have issues with control, I feel. Yes. And I've done that in the past. So that's where the learnings and the experience come in. So I remember when I had my store, I had a home furnishing store in Navin called Laura's Corner. Oh, wow. And even still, people still come up to me and say, oh, my God, I remember your store and I loved your store. It was a real destination. Uh, we were featured in Style at Home magazine, which was a national publication. It was, even though we were in a small little town, it it very much came became a popular spot. And uh, and and I loved the store, but I remember that I ended up trying to do all of the accounting. Now, Fatty, you don't want a marketing person doing the accounting, hundred percent, you know. But I didn't realize I was trying to do it all myself. So because you know, obviously, it was expensive to to run a store. When I look back, I realize that what people wanted was they wanted to see me on the floor, talking to people, designing, decorating. That's always been my my the passion as side. well, the creative side. Yeah. And they wanted me to help them figure out what their living yeah. room should be. And we had custom furniture. But here I was upstairs in the, you know, with a closed door trying to figure out accounting, which probably took me 10 hours that would have taken an accountant mm-hmm. one hour to do. Mm-hmm. So those are all the learnings along the way. And and now I don't even try to do that. Yeah. 
I have someone else do the things that I'm not good at. Exactly. And that's one of the things that like I, I'd struggled with for the last couple of years is like trying to figure out, okay, so what do I need to outsource? Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I, I, I might need someone to do some paperwork. I'm yeah, the admin. horrible at paperwork. Not that I, I can't do it, but it takes me double the time just because of my ADHD. Yeah. And I know that I, I can get it done a lot faster by someone that's, that's their sort of specifications or their yeah. job title is doing paperwork, yeah. admin work. So you pass that on yeah, to them. Yeah, it's and hard to focus on that when you're going yeah. to 10 different appointments and you're going to this fundraiser and you're doing that and you're, yeah. you're doing business development. How do you focus on the, yeah. the paperwork? Mm-hmm. So that's a good thing to pass off to someone else. Exactly. And then the same kind of, you know, one of the other things that I was also able to pass on is like, okay, I'm really great at going out and getting clients, like that sort of hunting, yes. you know, just going out to networking events and all of that stuff. But once they're in, like... Obviously, you got to carry the torch and yeah. you can only take on so many clients. But I'm able to bring in, you know, 50, 60 clients a month if I wanted to. But right. what do I got to do? And you need to someone to manage. Exactly. Almost so like you start growing project, the team right. and you're dealing with this. You're dealing with this type of client. You're dealing with that type of client. Yeah. You're only doing commercial kind of thing. Carrie, it's been lovely. Really appreciate you being on the show. And uh, for folks that are watching, thank you so much for, uh, for following us and if you want to watch more episodes like this, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more and more. And hit the bell icon so you can actually get alerted anytime that new episode comes out. And if you want to know about more about Carrie, don't forget to follow her on LinkedIn. She's fantastic. She's been doing this work for quite some time since she was five years old. So <laughs> thank you so much again. Thank you, Patty. I really appreciate it. It's been so fun. Perfect.